Um, I think it's, is it 10 past nine now? Thank you for coming along this morning. I can normally see the people in broad green. I can't, the video link isn't there today, but welcome if you're the, I know the person who goes at broad green. Um, this is a presentation on the Clinical Ethics Committee. It's a sales pitch in many ways. It's largely promotional. I think clinical ethics as a specialism in this country is around about where palliative medicine and pain medicine were 30 or 40 years ago. So it's an emerging discipline which still really, I think, needs to make a case for itself to persuade people that we have something to offer as an objective opinion that you don't already do yourselves. Although having said that, I think what we do is just slightly a, a more detailed version of what people are very good at in the first place. So this extracts from what clinicians are doing themselves already, but it partly gives an independent expert opinion, but also a purpose of clinical ethics, as I'll mention as we go on, is to try and retain some of the expertise that develops over time as people make difficult choices and difficult decisions for and with their patients. Would you do me a favor, please, and just show me with your hands if you've been to one of these presentations before about the Clinical Ethics Committee? Great, so not so many of you, because a, a lot of what I'll say goes over similar ground that I've covered in the past. Um, so my name's John Brighton, I'm the Trust Clinical Ethicist, and as you can see, I'm also a member of the uh, Board of Trustees of the UK Clinical Ethics Network, which is a charity which oversees the development and promotion of clinical ethics support in this country and supports individual clinical ethics committees to do better in the host organizations. The aims I have today are quite simple. I'm gonna tell you, if you don't already know, what a clinical ethics committee should do, and then focus on the competence of this trust's clinical ethics committee to do those things. And I'll also, in the latter, stage of the latter stages of the presentation, give you some information about what we've been doing over the last 12 months, particularly, particularly concentrating on uh, case referrals that we've had and the opinions that we've given on those things. And I think in particular, because a sense, in a sense this is a sales pitch, I want you to know what some of the referring clinicians have said to us in feedback about the uh, involvement we've had in their cases. So what in general terms should a clinical ethics committee do? Quite simply, it should support provide support and advice to help professionals and patients on ethical issues arising from clinical practice or patient care. Now, clinicians are dealing with these issues all the time, so we would expect really to be involved in some of the more challenging decisions which are in some sense more difficult, more unusual, or things that you've, decisions perhaps that you've made that you want then to reflect on to inform your future practice. This can take the form of case consultations, so referring particular cases involving patients, and I'll go through a dozen of those later on. We have some involvement in policy development, as clinical ethics committees should, and we're also involved in education and training to an extent, but we're trying to build um, in that area. We've only been, I suppose, fully fledged in this organization for, I think, two or three years now, so we're working on that element. And I think there are three levels, really, of clinical ethics support. One level is signposting. Very often, a referral will come, and it may not even reach the uh, stage of discussion with the full committee or being written up as a referral. And it might be just that somebody asks me a question, I can direct them to the relevant professional guidance or code of practice or legal precedent. There can be... Uh, Issues requiring resolution where there are dilemmas, where there's a choice between two, two or more possible courses of action and you'd like an independent opinion on which way to go. And then I think what's more rare but clearly is more interesting, arguably, for people who are professional ethicists are the genuinely new cases of things that haven't been considered before. And that becomes possible, of course, as medical technology develops and we're able to do things that previously we weren't able to do. I think in understanding what clinical ethics is, it's important also to point out what it, is, what it is not, and we have to be very careful not to be answering questions about research ethics review, uh, research ethics questions. So research ethics is concerned with uh, preparing and conducting research in the proper manner, 
in accordance with statutes and national guidance. And of course, those issues may go on to have clinical application. But in the case of clinical ethics, we're concerned with analyzing and resolving issues of an ethical nature which arise from clinical practice. Having said that, although we're not directly concerned with research ethics review, for which there's a, a national service, we are very much concerned with innovation. So in particular, something might be being considered as a possible proposal for research. Getting it through research and being able to conduct the research in an ethical manner is one issue. A related issue is whether or not it's worth doing the research, depending on whether or not it's something which could actually ethically be applied in clinical practice once the study is completed. So our particular Clinical Ethics Committee here, like others, is um, what we regard as an expert advisory group. I'll take you through the membership in a moment and I give some sort of justification for the notion of expertise there, but we are there to advise. We can be accessed voluntarily by individual members of staff or by multidisciplinary teams, and I stress voluntarily. And the aim of these things is to support multidisciplinary teams and the trust in analyzing ethical issues that arise from clinical practice in a systematic, repeatable, memorable fashion. So there are a number of things that that can manifest itself as. It could be promoting and sharing good practice which already exists. It might be to do with looking at a particular way that things are being done and trying to improve it where appropriate. But as I've mentioned a couple of times, it's also, I think, very importantly to do with remembering and retaining ethical decision-making knowledge and skills. So in the same way that if an orthopedic surgeon left the trust, there would be mechanisms in place for replacing the skills and experience of that surgeon. We want to make sure that as people leave the trusts and knowledge, knowledge in relation to ethical practice doesn't leave with them. Is this something which is needed? And as I say, this is not um, a question unique to clinical ethics. This is, I think, uh, a question that other emerging medical specialities have had to deal with in the past. This is a quote from a report of a working party of the Royal College of Physicians, which reported in 2005. And essentially their answer was yes, that matters are increasingly complex. There are new and increasingly complex therapeutic possibilities in medical practice. And the relationships between physicians and patients and other professionals, the advent of consumerism on the, consumerism on the ward means that ethical decisions are, be, are becoming more complex. And I think that was true in 2005. I think it's arguably even more true 10 years on. So they were arguing that ethical judgments in clinical practice are actually harder now than they might have been 20 years ago. The background to this was the RCP had made a, re a similar report on whether or not there was a case for systematic review of research ethics in 1985. And there were cynical um, commentators in those days that thought that wasn't necessary. So the RCP's working party was more or less arguing that the situation in clinical ethics is somewhat like the situation in research ethics 20 years before 2005. And what they were at pains to stress and made a number of recommendations about was that with that need comes advice that's reliable, thoughtful, and informed, as well as, as well as sensitive to local needs and mores. So that's essentially what we're interested in fulfilling. So where does it come from? Clinical ethics has got a different provenance to research ethics review. Not entirely, but partly, research ethics provenance arises from research malpractice. And I won't go through any of the um, things of which you're probably well aware. But because of various scandals over decades and 100 years or so uh, of unconsented research, in inverted commas, using unwitting medical uh, human participants, the regulation of research was developed and has become a, a very uh, clearly regulated system in this country and internationally. But it has the effect, therefore, of being top-down. It's an obligation to seek the opinion of a research ethics committee if you propose to do research. It's regulatory. There's an obligation to comply. 
Clinical ethics support, on the other hand, has generally grown from grassroots clinical demand. The model is one of an optional referral. So as I said in the earlier slides, it's referral voluntarily. It comes from the bottom up from the grassroots, as I say, but it's increasingly being absorbed into trust governance structures. So many of these things started with, very often I suppose the majority would be um, senior nurses but largely consultants who would get together and have discussions about issues in their clinical practice and maybe set up debate groups that would meet once a month or so. Many of those went on to be absorbed into the governance structures of the trust, some more successfully than others. And more recently, and I think ours is one of the, well I think ours is the best example of a committee which has been established from the outside within the governance structure of the host organization. Well, that clearly is the, is the more modern trend, and I think that's the way future for clinical ethics committees. So for the next several slides, I'm going to take you through some of the recommendations made by the RCP working party. And you can see the, hopefully that they're split into three sections. There's a per, and then three, and then two more. I'll go through these over the next few slides and see how we've tried to, met, to meet those recommendations of that RCP working party. So in relation to this recommendation that committees should publicize their existence and be clearly located in the trust governance, well, clearly this is one of the things I'm doing now. Um, I will make a pitch as well to, for you to invite me, please, to your team meetings. It's not so easy to fit this sort of thing into team meetings these days, the way quality governance um, meetings are structured within departments. But if you do have an annual or regular team meeting at which, you, at which you'd like me to come and explain the, this clinical ethics support function to your colleagues, I'd be very happy to come and do that. With regard to the location in the trust governance structure, this is the relatively new governance structure of this trust. So everything's answerable to the trust board, as you'd imagine, beneath which sits the quality governance committee. And then there are four subcommittees there into which various other groups report. And you can see in, in right on the far right, sorry, in red on the far right of your screen, uh, the clinical ethics committee reports through clinical and cost effectiveness. And we're in a similar position to that extent with things like the organ donation committee. Um, what else is in there? medicines management and cancer strategy and so on. This is the current membership. The sharp eyes of you will notice that there's uh, unfortunately a bit of a skew towards male membership at the moment. That wasn't the case up until about 12 months ago just because of um, natural attrition. A number of members left to go on to other things, leaving the trust or found that they didn't have time for this anymore. So we lost a number of members who all happen to be female, so I think that would be good if we could correct that. We have 15 members at the moment. We have scope for some more members. You can see as well the, uh, the job titles there. You'll hopefully recognize a number of the names there. And in the far right column, I've given details of the sort of qualifications in philosophy, healthcare ethics, and law. You'll note that, when, that there is no well, there is not in fact, nor is there any expectation that all members of, the clini of, of a clinical ethics committee should have qualifications in philosophy, ethics, or law. And indeed, I think it's a good thing that not everybody does. The expertise of one of these things is not just to do with formal technical knowledge or experience in clinical ethics or law. It's also to do with the expertise and experience which builds over many years of clinical practice. So we meet monthly. <coughs> we report, as I say, through the quality governance structure. As such, we are required to, and we welcome the requirement to submit an annual forward plan to the Clinical and Cost Effectiveness Committee, which in turn gets reported to quality governance. Uh, we give quarterly and annual reports on progress against that forward plan. And we have a formal transparent member application process, application process for members, I should say. And broadly speaking, the structure of our um, approach to giving support is that we, uh, wherever possible, encourage people to make written referrals. It's not strictly necessary. I will um, give advice verbally, as will other colleagues on the committee. It's not always necessary, and I think at times it would be un, uh, unduly and unnecessarily onerous to write stuff down uh, in terms of the referral. 
but I would expect people to make a note if it relates to a patient about the advice they've been given from the clinical ethicist or the clinical ethics committee. But by and large, we encourage written referrals for transparency and for accountability. Um, we have a documented consultation procedure which you can see on the trust intranet pages if you look at, if you search on the search bar clinical ethics committee. Although if you don't mind, don't do it for a few days because I'm just reconstructing the site so you'll get some old stuff and some new stuff. So hopefully it'll be up to date by the end of next week. We give written responses and we ask for evaluations from our referrers to give us some feedback on what they think of the interventions that we've made. So the next chunk of recommendations I showed you from the RCP Working Party um, were to do with mechanisms for timely responses, having clear procedures, and feeding back outcomes of case discussions to clinical areas. I'm not going to go to in into detail on that stuff. That's the sort of material you can see on the internet page if you'd like to look that up. And then finally, with their recommendations, they said the committee should audit their activities and establish links with other committees through a national network and work to an agreed statement of core competencies. So I'll just briefly take you through the, how we meet those requirements. So as I've said, we, meet, um, we report monthly and annually through the governance structure. We have an annual forward plan, and we're a member committee, subscribing member committee of this thing called the UK Clinical Ethics Network, of which I'm a member of the Board of Trustees. And that's essentially... Um, a network, as it says, of committees trying to inform each other about their good and bad experiences giving, a, uh, giving clinical ethics advice, learning from each other and trying to develop a systematic <coughs> network of formal um, expert advice. With regard to the agreed statement of core competencies, we as a committee are very careful to try and comply with something called the UKC and core competencies for clinical ethics committees. This was a joint uh, document developed by the UK Clinical Ethics Network and something called the Ethox Foundation, which is attached to Oxford University. So what sort of things should clinical ethics committees be involved in and what, what are we involved in, in? Well, to an extent, education training, policy development, which I'll mention, and the thing I'm going to concentrate most on for the remaining slides is case consultation. And when I speak about case consultation, the, generally speaking, what we have in mind are what are described here as live cases that, that need a decision. So that would be an issue probably involving a patient or a group of patients where a decision has to be made probably in the reasonably near future, um, where a team refers a matter to us because there's something special or unusual or complex about the case. In addition to that sort of thing, though, I, I do encourage people to think about um, think about this from two different angles. One is that if you make a live referral, keep in mind that the, uh, the advice that we give, because it is written advice and because you will have made a written request for advice, it can be useful for, to you for when you come up to your appraisal and revalidation requirements. So if, as you do, you need to demonstrate how you've reflected on your difficult cases. You need to uh, um, include supporting evidence in your appraisal or revalidation documentation. It can be very useful to indicate, to, to, de to be able to demonstrate, I should say, that you've made a written referral and you have written feedback and you've, you can account for how you've taken that advice into account. More importantly than that, we're interested in being involved in facilitating for you and supporting you in the need that you have to reflect on your difficult cases as a team. So maybe a written referral and a written response can help you to, uh, can help to inform your own team discussions. But again, if, if you'd like it, I'm more than happy to come and join in a discussion if you want to um, seek your clinical ethic support in that fashion. So with regard to education and training, we've been, we've been up and running um, to full capacity for a couple of years now. But this year we're planning to, uh, as part of our annual forward plan, which is about to be ratified by the Clinical Effectiveness Committee, we're planning to conduct a scoping exercise to look at what currently exists in terms of formal in training through in induction or mandatory training or other opportunities for colleagues with regard to clinical ethical issues. 
A couple of colleagues on the committee and I are developing a program of brief introductions to clinical ethical issues in clinical practice through the University of Liverpool with the support of our pan at the moment. And as I've said, I'm available to come and do training sessions for you if you'd like to invite me. So, function of the Clinical Ethics Committee, education training, involvement in policy development and case consultations. Coming now to policy and procedure development, these are the sort of things that we've been involved with over the last few years. I won't go through these in great detail, but if you want to ask me about any of them later on, you're welcome to. I think one of the things that this illustrates is that as clinicians, we have a lot on our plates in terms of keeping up to date with, the, with, with clinical practice and the latest developments in our fields of specialism. How, in addition, can you also know the details of things like the Gender Recognition Act 2004, all of the finer points of depri deprivation of liberty safeguards? There's a lot in terms of professional guidance and knowledge of statutory requirements and precedent in case law to keep up with that is very, actually very difficult for you to do on your own. So one of the important things about a clinical ethics support function, we're not giving, I should say, legal advice, but clearly it's given within a legal context, is to be supportive in that in, in order to enable you to be up to date and to acknowledge where you're not up to date and where you couldn't possibly be up to date and have a source of independent opinion to which you can turn when you know that there's something that's probably on guidance about, but you don't know where to find it. One of the um, big recurrent issues that we're, well, a couple of big recurrent issues that we're dealing with concern um, the statutory duty of candor and how that fits with the professional duty of candor. I think it's entirely understandable if healthcare professionals at the moment are, on, are a little confused about the overlap between the two things. The Mental Capacity Act keeps coming up, and Mental Capacity Assessment is a really important thing. And I was talking to one of my colleagues on the committee just before we started this presentation this morning about um, the need that we have to try and keep on readdressing the need to improve people's awareness of the requirements of the Mental Capacity Act 2005, which has been around for 10 years now, but is still uh, not specifically in this trust, but generally not very well understood. And we had a, um, a, a very, very interesting referral about an issue which concerned patients, but not current patients of this trust, which was the, um, the, the trust's involvement as a surge hospital in the outbreak of Ebola. So what things have we, what case consultations have we dealt with in the past? They were the policy and procedure development issues that we've been involved with. So with regard to past case consultations, we had um, uh, one interesting case of a, of a patient who, this was a couple of years ago, who was uh, attending from um, one of the local prisons for uh, recurrent daycare who was quite disruptive. And this was a very interesting case, I think, from my point of view, because essentially what, to my mind, this demonstrated how well a multidisciplinary team was dealing with this issue. And they had uh, a team meeting on a, um, on first thing on a Monday morning after colleagues had had a difficult time with this chap on, on, uh, during the weekend. But there were certain details of, of the case that they just wanted some further independent opinion about, and we gave that, um, I suppose, supplementary supportive advice, which more or less, I think, actually did fully co uh, correspond with the direction they thought they ought to travel. But it was just a sort of a, a, a nuance or a detail of the, the things that they um, were aware of. And we were able to add some, um, I suppose, some more detailed and less common advice about the things that they should take into account when they were assessing mental capacity. This was a DNA CPR that had some over, uh, an issue of DNA CPR that had some overlap with um, a patient's existing advanced directive, and it was, it was a, a question of interpretation of, of that. 
This was a long program of work I did with a former colleague, um, Prof D'Amato, who um, has subsequently left the, the trust, who um, had this practice of diagnosing um, patients' uh, ocular tumors on a Monday and giving them the option to have very radical treatment, including excision, on the following day. And we published the paper on that. Uh, and another thing that we did some um, long-standing work on with colleagues in uh, an angina management program. So this is the last year. So what I've given here is the, I thought maybe, I'd, if I'd given the last financial year, the numbers would be similar. So this is a dozen case consultations over the last 12 months. And how do you benchmark that? Well, there was a, in terms of numbers, there was a publication in 2012 of a detailed survey of clinical ethics committees um, published in the Journal of Medical Ethics. And these 12 case referrals put us up in the top few of 67 or so registered clinical ethics committees in this country. So, as I said at the beginning, this is a, this is a, a, a type of service which still needs to promote itself, justify itself, and pitch. I'm actually really quite satisfied with this number given the numbers of referrals to other committees because we've only been up and running for a couple of years and I think we have this number of referrals because we have significant support from the trust. We were able to set up, as I say, from the outset within the governance structure, uh, within the governance structure of this organization. And the medical director is extremely supportive. But I would like to increase these numbers. Well, you can see on the left-hand column there the, um, the month of referral, the source of referral. So I've just given in, in broad terms. These are largely referrals from consultants. We can take referrals from any member of staff, but one of the things that we are very careful to do, and you'll see this in our terms of, terms of reference and our consultation procedure, we are not here to resolve arguments between colleagues that are not ethics arguments, difference of opinion. So we would be very careful to screen out whistleblowing issues. We would be very careful to screen out uh, questions that are to do with research ethics. We would be very careful to screen out grievances about the way somebody's dealing with something through procedures and policies for dealing all that sort of stuff. So what we have as a standard requirement is that if um, somebody does make a referral, we are very keen, we ask explicitly for the referrer to confirm that the lead clinician for the case, if indeed it involves a patient, has approved of the referral to the committee. But also we go a bit further than that because we don't just want it to be the referrer who very often is the lead clinician or the referrer and the lead clinician. If you have an active and um, positively constructive multidisciplinary team approach, Really, when you refer a matter to the Clinical Ethics Committee, you need to check it out with everybody to make sure that there's nobody uh, who's going to feel aggrieved that it's, for example, that it might have got to us without them knowing it. So the um, column in the middle there, you can see what sort of things we've considered withholding, um, clinically assisted nutrition and hydration and determining what somebody's best interests are in those circumstances. We had two very, very interesting cases which were really similar in terms of the ethical issues, but were from completely different clinical disciplines. They both involved patients in their 20s, um, but with different diagnoses, different treatments, uh, different teams referring. But they shared this issue of dealing with these patients' erratic compliance with, with treatment, and the implications of that for their prognosis and therefore for their consent. These, I thought, were two fascinating cases because these were young people who, for their own reasons, were sort of dipping in and out of treatment, for whom their consent to resume treatment on each occasion really was getting more and more complex. So you know that in order to give consent, you have to have med capacity to give consent. And I don't think the med capacity as such of these two individuals was called into question by their behavior. But if you think of the requirements uh, in the Mental Capacity Act for establishing that somebody has mental capacity, they need to understand the information rele relevant to the information, they need to be able to, um, uh, to retain it, and they need to be able to use it in the balance in uh, weighing the information to come to a decision, which they then communicate. 
with these two particular patients in, in particular, with these two patients in particular, what essentially was happening was over time, by dipping in and out of long-term treatment, they're both chronically ill, each successive reinstatement of treatment was likely, in the opinion of the clinical team, to be less effective. So there were, there were prognost adverse prognostic imp implications for the erratic compliance. And that then generates difficult issues in terms of consent. It becomes a more difficult issue to understand the, the medium and long-term implications of complying half-heartedly with treatment. It becomes more difficult for the clinicians, I have to say as well, to, to make judgments and estimations of the risks and likely benefits of engaging with treatment. The Ebola case, um, I think, was fascinating. I think maybe that's a grand round in its own right. Um, I, I, can, I won't catch his eye now, but I can see one of the people that was involved in that. And um, One of the things I'd like to do for a grand round in future, I think, would be for the Clinical Ethics Committee to do a joint presentation with one of the referring teams who've referred the case. And this is something that might be actually quite interesting to, to colleagues in the trust. If clinicians could go take, take a grand round through the sort of issues that they were coming across in clinical practice they thought were challenging and prompted them to make a referral to the Clinical Ethics Committee. This was a referral that came from two sources. It came from uh, consultants that were involved in the case and from the medical director. And this concerned the difficult clinical decisions that would need to be made about a patient with suspected Ebola being admitted to the trust and the implications for protection and safeguarding, uh, protection and safeguarding of other patients. Uh, and, and also the, the difficult challenge of making judgments about patients when they're only suspected to have Ebola, when actually they may have a much better prognosis because it might turn out to be the symptoms of malaria. Um, the January 15 one there is probably more of a standard uh, case that you might expect to be refer, uh, referred to a clinical ethics committee to do with a disagreement between the clinical team and the family over what constitutes the best interests of a, of a patient where the family is looking for aggressive treatment and the medical team thinks it's becoming futile or at least in, not in the interest of the patient. And you can see towards the bottom there, there are a few things ongoing at the moment. One of these, you can see 11 of those 12 were live cases. One, the Ebola case, was not a specific patient, but was to do with planning for anticipated specific patients. All of the others involve particular patients. One is uh, a referral of a case where a clinical team wanted some support in thinking through the issues that had already been dealt with. So I call it a retrospective case analysis. And that's the sort of thing I have in mind when I'm saying to you, keep this in your thoughts, keep the possibility of referring to the Clinical Ethics Committee in your thoughts when you're thinking through your um, reflective practice and thinking about what sort of evidence you could produce in your appraisal and revalidation submissions. So coming towards the end now, the sort of feedback that we've had from referrers, um, I've given some examples here. The idea that Involvement of the Clinical Ethics Committee helped the team to crystallize concerns and to formulate an approach. Um, coming up with an, a comprehensive assessment where the issues were particularly complex and there were varied opinions within the um, multidisciplinary team. course in um, commerce and for people like me who find themselves thinking they're in ethics and turns out they're in sales, it's very important to have indications of uh, a willingness to re-refer and to um, recommend to other people. We have been able in all cases to um, answer questions on time. I think one of the things I, um, I didn't dwell on, the, um, let me, can I go back? Yeah. The column on the right there over disposal, generally speaking, it's, it's desirable, if you can get it, for a written referral to be given a written response after consultation at the next regular meeting of the full Clinical Ethics Committee, because then you benefit from 
um, the full expertise of the whole committee and the committee gets more time to think through the issues. Also, generally speaking, or, or always, we will encourage the referrer, to, the referrer and colleagues to come and attend the discussion. Um, however, some things sometimes are urgent. Sometimes people require a decision sooner than the next clinical ethics committee. So we have in our consultation procedure, which again you can see on the trust intranet, specific mechanisms for what we call a rapid response team. So this would be um, a subgroup of the clinical ethics committee convened at short notice and we can give a reply within two days or within five days by negotiation with the referrer. Sometimes that is necessary. Um, there are only a couple of them there. There is a view in clinical ethics, I think from bioethicists who are academics who um, are interested in dealing with these things, that this sort of on-call type model of clinical ethics is, is the way to go. That's the common model in North America where clinical ethics committees and clinical, ethics are, uh, clinical ethicists are more prevalent. I don't really anticipate that that will happen in this country. I think the model will be and really ought to be uh, a more considered um, uh, approach that allows for a bit of time, but we have the mechanism for answering quickly. And as I say, we haven't missed a deadline yet. So um, we are here to give advice. We are absolutely not interested in or here for undermining existing decision making processes. Our function and our purpose is to resolve ethical challenges and dilemmas ar um, arising from clinical practice, but we're not an alternative mechanism for these other things that I mentioned earlier on. And we are very careful, as I've said, not to encroach on other types of review for which there are highly regulated national systems of um, support. If you have any questions, I'm uh, very happy to take them. That's as much information as I want to, to give this morning. As I say, I think it would be good if we could book um, another grand round at some point where I do a combined presentation with a referrer where we can take you through the process and some detail of some issues that we've discussed. Do you have any questions? Can I just ask you first of all, what, what, what do you mean when you say it hasn't been disseminated in the trust? Well, I'm not aware of it. So it might, uh, might of the whole might function? Be. It's just... The particular case? Yeah. And if it's of national importance, then I would have thought perhaps it would be on the internet. Like a lot of other general topics are drawn to our attention for action or awareness. Um, I'm going to ask somebody who's involved in the case um, I know yes um, I, John is it okay with you if I talk about Ebola, yes. yeah so uh, I'm not going to ask you I mean comment by all means but this this was the Ebola case and the, the issue here was um, the clinicians who are involved and I think John will probably confirm this uh, and, and the committee itself and um, up to board level in the trust I think had a concern that there were significant ethical issues involved in um, the management of people coming to this country with suspected Ebola um, who would not get access to the two specialist um, beds in the Royal Free Hospital and would be admitted to surge hospitals elsewhere. Um, some of the ethical issues that were involved in those decision making we thought and the clinicians thought should be uh, a matter for national debate. We thought the public should be aware of the sort of difficult resource allocation considerations that were, uh, would need to be made in individual patient cases. There was a, a weekly national teleconference between colleagues here and in the Surge Hospital and NHS England and other um, interested parties uh, that took into account the advice that we 
uh, as a clinical ethics committee gave. Um, but maybe this is the point I need to um, hand over to, to John. Thanks. I mean, we, we found it really useful using the ethics committee. The, the problem we had was we were anticipating a complete unknown quantity of patients who may or may not have Ebola coming to our A&E. The core difficulty was there's at least a 24-hour turnaround time on the diagnostic test. And what do we do when we've got a patient who's got a perhaps 10% chance of Ebola and then this patient does have it with a separate exercise demonstrated that they had a, uh, a high chance of infecting staff and closing down our services uh, and uh, there's an ethical issue there but there's a 90% chance they've just got malaria or, or typhoid uh, so what we're going to do when someone pitches up to the A&E and says I've been to the right place in the, in the world and I've got the right symptoms and you're not going to know for 24 hours whether I've got Ebola or not um, so we sought your help on this and this was a discussion that was going between uh, London and the other research centres as to because we wanted a unified policy and uh, with your help we came to the correct but hard decision that if you turn up and you've got malaria but we don't know it's not Ebola 24 hours you're not going to get intensive care and if you suffer as a result sorry you're a casualty of the Ebola epidemic and uh, we at the search centres and it was helpful to the other search centres that we were able to say we can provide this committee and we're all you know, quite satisfied this is the right way to go. And, uh, but I think in answer to, to Godfrey's question, um, this was something that was um, mulled over by the clinicians in this trust and their colleagues in the surge hospitals. Um, it was then considered by an objective group of people in the Clinical Ethics Committee and in a sense we, we escalated the ethical issue discussion in the national teleconference which was weekly but I suppose it wasn't the decision for us or for the individual surge centers to open that up to national public debate I suspect it didn't happen because the patients didn't turn up I think if they'd started turning up and it required admission then it would have been um, it would have been debated more widely Thank you for asking. Sorry, but, oh God, <laughs> somebody else has got the microphone. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just to to clarify, because you, you're encouraging to to refer more more and more clinical cases, and and there is a, a rapid response uh, plan. But if that goes on, probably you will be inundated. I mean, there there are there are many dilemmas. So, is there a plan or something to? To, to build up on that. I, I don't know how it works. You, you mentioned it in, in, in the States, but it looks like in, uh, in certain situations you want the, the input of the ethicists to, to, well, at least to have that opinion or, or the global opinion from the, from the, from the committee. Uh, is there anything in place for that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 if you'll allow me a, a moment of modesty in terms of not myself but the committee. I, I, being a member of the Board of um, Trustees for the UK Clinical Ethics Network, I know um, in great detail what sort of services are provided in other trusts. There's a, they're, they're good. Um, there's, an, there's a particularly good one in Great Ormond Street, which has been um, around for about 20 years or so. Um, there are two particularly prominent people involved in the Clinical Ethics Network who've been involved with that for um, respectively 10 and 20 years. Um, along with them, I think we're the best mechanism in this country um, for a number of reasons, because of the transparency and formality and, and accountability of our mechanisms, because of the, um, the quality of discussions that we have um, uh, in, in, in real terms when cases are referred, because of the expertise we have on the committee, because of the support that we have from the organization, because of the way we report into the um, organization, because of the support from the medical director. And this clinical ethics committee has a clinical ethicist, so I'm available to deal with things at short notice. Um, and I would say as well, uh, members have been extremely good at engaging with rapid, rapid requests for opinions. Um, 
there haven't been a huge amount, but when, they, when they've arisen, we have um, e enough of a critical mass of people available that either I can give an opinion um, as the, the trust clinical eth ethicist, or I can quickly um, get the opinion of a few of us, and we meet certain criteria for a rapid response team. So it has to be um, a medic involved, um, somebody with postgraduate experience, uh, qualifications in, in healthcare ethics and or law, and um, uh, a non-medic healthcare professional as well. So uh, I, I'm, I would like to be inundated. I, I don't see that as a problem, that would be positive. And there was somebody behind you. So sorry, and if you're thinking of inundating us with some referrals, please fire away. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, I think a lot of us, rightly or wrongly, uh, feel we're working in quite a litigious environment. Um, and my question was, the extent to which you have legal advice within the committee and uh, how important it is to feel that you'd be able to stand up to any legal challenge to the advice that you give, particularly because there may often be a disconnect between what's perceived to be ethical and what the legal framework underpinning these decisions might be. For example, the assisted dying debate that's just gone on. Yeah, um, we, um, I'm not sure which order to say what I'm about to say because I don't want to give the wrong emphasis. Um, I think the first thing I'll say is we are very, very careful explicitly um, during our discussions to identify what's legal and what's ethical. Uh, we do not give, eth uh, we don't give legal advice. Um, where legal advice is required, we would strongly recommend a referrer to contact the trust solicitors either through the claims team during the day or through the duty manager out of hours. Um, having said that, our advice is necessarily given within a, a legal context, as I've said. Very often what we will be gi giving is advice about statute. Um, now, why would we do that? If you think about it, um, where issues of mental capacity arise, there is the Mental Capacity Act, and uh, supporting the Mental Capacity Act, there is the Mental Capacity Act Code of Practice. So we're very familiar with the content of the Mental Capacity Act Code of Practice, which is a fantastic document that I would recommend ev and everybody or anybody read, but it, you know, you've got a lot of other stuff to read, you can't read everything. Having said those couple of things, I would also di you know, uh, direct your attention to the, the, the membership, and in particular, we have somebody um, who is able to give um, extremely expert advice on what counts as legal and what doesn't who can keep, up, keep us up to date with latest developments in, um, in medical law, and it's um, Professor Michael Jones, who is very recently um, partially retired Professor of Medical Law at the, at the University of Liverpool, who is the author of the, um, what has been for many, many years, the leading textbooks on um, medical negligence taught law in general. So I, I suppose the best thing I can say is we're acutely aware of the, um, um, the shared ground between ethical advice and legal advice and we are very careful, explicitly so, not to give legal advice and to advise people when they need it. And, and similarly, for example, um, on a couple of the current cases that I mentioned on the, the, the last 12 months referrals, um, there's somebody else behind as well. Um, likewise, we've, we've given strong recommendations that people contact the safeguarding team, for example. Neil? Okay. Thank you for coming.